team, we'd like to welcome everybody this morning to Marine Bible Fellowship. We're going to be in the song of Solomon, and it's a love story. Um, and uh, I titled this um, uh, Banner Over Me is Love. Um, let's look at this. The Song of Solomon is, is a love story. If you look at the, the, the book, it's another one of these books that's really difficult. Um, uh, I, I don't want to see it because it's a love story, and I don't want to you know, turn red and flush in the pulpit. But it's all between Solomon and his bride, the Shunammite uh, shepherdess. But it's also full of metaphors, um, of Eastern imagery that we might find hard to understand. Here's, here's one that I find really uh, confusing. Uh, look at just chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 for a second. Just, this is what I mean by a metaphor that may be difficult to understand. Uh, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves behind the veil. Now, so far, he's doing okay. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. You can slip in a little bit there. I'm not sure that women would like to be referred to as goats, but it's okay. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes, and you've come up from the washing, all which bears its twin. Not one among them has lost its young. And so, gentlemen, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice here, a caution here. Um, next time you want to be romantic, I do not suggest you open with this line. <laughs> Your teeth remind me of shorn sheep, but at least you have all of them. Just, just that's my advice. So that's what I mean. That the, the Book of Solomon is, is, is allegorical. It's it's full of metaphors and it's uh, Eastern speech that tells us a story. Um, but uh, I would say that's going to conclude my, my romantic advice for the day, but I'm going to throw a few more in there as well. Um, so if we look at Saul and Solomon from a literal sense, and we just read the story for itself, it really is a romantic love story and, uh, and between two young lovers. But if we look at it in the, in the allegorical sense, in, in the abstract, um, it's a deep spiritual meaning. So a metaphor is a story, an illustration, a made-up story that tells another story that, that illustrates a point or helps make a point. Jesus taught with parables. Parables would be a form of allegory, if you will. So, so it's symbolism, but it's, it's, it's an abstract story of, of spiritual meaning. And if we see God as the groom in the story, and the nation of Israel or the church as the bride of Christ, and if you want to look at it from an Old Testament or a New Testament perspective, it becomes a story of God's unconditional love for man. So this morning I want to look at it from an allegorical sense so we might learn about God's unconditional love for us and how our love for our Creator, our Lord, and our Savior should look like in our daily life. So I want to look at this from a, as a love story between us and God. Not Solomon and the Shulamite shepherdess. Let's go ahead and pray. So I thank you again for this morning. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you again for this church that you are building. This, this, these people that you are bringing together. Help us to bring glory and honor to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we fly through the, the book of the Song of Solomon, I'm going to stop. And uh, we're going to ponder God's love for us. Um, but for the sake of time, we're going to fly through it. Um, this is kind of a helicopter sermon. We're going to fly along, and then we're going to stop, and then we're going to pick up, and we're going to fly along, and we're going to stop. And uh, I hope to get through the whole book today, but uh, I can confess to you that I will not get through the whole, the whole book today. Um, so uh, we'll get started. So look at uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, the first place I want to drop the helicopter in and stop. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. So think about that. I want us to look at that for a second. I want us to look at that phrase, let us run. I want us to focus on the word us for a second. No Christian is called to go it alone. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. 
We're, we're called into a fellowship. And that's why the, the church is so important. We are called into a fellowship with God, and we're called into a fellowship with fellow Christians in the context of us. It's the context of us. It's not I and me. It's us. It's the context of of us and yesterday some of us uh, got together and we worked on the front of the building and next time we get together and some others of us will get together and we'll work on the building and it's us the church is us we are working together to walk to work on the church we are building the church together it is us we think about it this way it's 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 you and me and God us, the church, together, running the race that is the Christian life. So I want us to focus again on that word, us. Now, if we go back to Ecclesiastes, why is us important? If you go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 12, I'm, not, you, I'm, not, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit for you. Um, that's Elaine's and my um, verse, our theme verse for our wedding. Uh, we had that read in our wedding, and it's a verse we go to. And it basically says, uh, if, if, uh, if there's one person, and he's all by himself, I'm paraphrasing the story here, if one person is all by himself and he falls into a trap, so to speak, he can't get himself out of it. He's just stuck. But if two, if two, two, two people are, are walking along and one falls into a trap, then his friends can get him out of it. His friend can help him help get him, help help him get out of the, the trap that he's fell in to. And then it goes on to say that a cord of three is not easily broken. And so that's you, a friend, and God. That's us. You see, see, sometimes, sometimes you're going to be the one that's doing the lifting. You're going to be the friend that's lifting someone out of a mess, a trap, some something that's that's dragging them down and bogging them down, sometimes you're going to be the one that needs lifting. But as a church, as a family, and when we focus on the us, if we're always together, uh, then we have that. Sometimes, sometimes we carry somebody else's burdens, and sometimes somebody carries our burdens. And uh, as I've got older and developed a heart condition, I've had to learn to let others carry my burdens. I can't do the literally the physical carrying and the lifting that I used to be able to do. And, and so sometimes you carry and sometimes you're carried. But it's all in the context of us. And that's what I want to talk about. Let us run together. You and me and God. Let us run the race that is before us. I want you to drop down to verse 15 in the same chapter. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, your eyes are doves. Now, on a personal romantic level, think about this now. I'm going to get a little romantic here. Um, this is maybe not good romantic advice, but I'm an old guy, so give me, give me, give me a chance. Love grows out of praise. Term, terms of endearment. When we, when we look at our wife and say, you look nice today. Or our wife looks at us and say, I like that shirt. Or oh, you, you combed your hair today, it looks good. <laughs> you, you, you'll you look nice. When, so these terms of endearment, when, now in our house, Elaine's the cook, okay? And that's because we enjoy eating good food. And if, we, if I cooked, we would not get to enjoy eating good food. So Elaine's the cook. But even after all these years, it's nice for me to say, hey, that was a really nice meal. The other night we had macaroni and cheese, homemade macaroni and cheese, though, by the way. And it was really, really good. Nothing fancy, nothing special, but it was really, really good. So I said, honey, this was really, really good, macaroni and cheese. We talked about which, all the things that she did to make it because she made homemade macaroni and cheese, and it was really, really good. Something simple, but those terms of endearment, um, that, that uh, you, you did a uh, great job on that. I, I, when you, you fixed that, you made it look nice. You made it look right. You fixed it. You know, those terms of, of endearment, those praises. You see, if you think about it, when you do that, it's just another way of saying I love you. 
that was really good macaroni and cheese is another way of saying, I really appreciate who you are. And I really love you. And so we, so praise is another way of saying I love you. Um, and, and trust me, guys, your wife, this is, this is another one of those free marital advice things. Guys, <laughs> girls never tired of being told they're beautiful. Just, just remember that. They just never, ever tire of that. So just a little piece of advice. And, uh, and how special she is to you. They'll never, ever tired of that. And that, and that she's an awesome cook and a great mom. And when, you, when you give your wife praise like that, she's never going to say, hey, shut up, stop that. It's never going to happen. Now, gals, I want you to give you some little advice too here. You know how to get your husband to do some things. You got you have, ever, you have a honey do list. You know how to get your husband to do that honey do list. You don't nag him about the next thing on the list. You praise him about the last one he finished. You say, you know, when you painted the kitchen, you did an awesome job on the kitchen. You don't remind him that you don't remind him that he needs to paint that he promised to paint the bathroom. You praise him about the job he did in the kitchen. He'll remember himself that he promised to do the bathroom, and he's gonna want more praise, and he's gonna go paint the bathroom. Just free advice. But but this these terms of in, in, in these these terms of endearment, um, you know, and we just do this. Think about this in, in, in a sense of our relationship with God as well. When we worship God, praise him for our past promises kept, when we when we Think about our life, and we reflect back on our life, just like we would, re would reflect back on a on a nice meal, or a nice mowed lawn, or a nice painted bedroom, you know, something, you know, something like that. We reflect on all the things that God has done for us, all the promises that He has made to us, and all the promises He's kept, and all the blessings that we have. You know, food to eat, we have a place to live, we have a job, we have. Uh, we have uh, things that we have uh, that he's provided for us. And we just look back at all the promises he's made to us and he's kept. And we say, thank you, Lord. What are we saying? I love you, God. I love you. Thank you for all that you've given me. And, and this strengthens our faith. See, when I tell my wife I love her, it strengthens our relationship. When I tell my wife she's a great cook, it strengthens our relationship. When I tell her she's a great mom, it strengthens our relationship. When I say, God, I love you, thank you for, and I list all the things that God has done for me, it strengthens our relationship. But it also deepens, in, 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 in our relationship with God, it also deepens our faith, it deepens our commitment, it strengthens that bond because there's a lot of promises that God has made that have yet to come true. You know, I believe that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, but I haven't died and gone to heaven yet. That's a promise that God has made to me, but it's a promise that's not yet fulfilled because I'm still alive. But it gives me faith. It gives me hope that in, in the promises that I reflect on, those, all those promises made, it helps me reflect on the promises that God has made but also think about it from this perspective. God, just like our spouse, never tear, tear, tires of hearing us say, I love you. You did a great job. Thank you. That was really nice. God doesn't either. God never tires of, I love you. God never tires of, thank you for, fill in the blank. What he's blessed you for. He never, he never tires of that. And so if we remember our past and we remember our present blessings and we give God the glory, it's the same thing as saying, I love you. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. I love you. You're special. You're important to me. When I think of you, I think of good things. And, and that's how our relationship should be with God. We think of all the good things. It's the same thing as saying, I love you, Lord. Let's take a minute and let's go to chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Let's move there for a second and see what's going on there. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. 
This is the, the shepherd is speaking. As a lily among brown blows, so is my love among the young women. Now, this is Solomon speaking. Now, Shumite speaks again. The shepherd speaks. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sit in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banquet house, and his banner over me is love. There's a lot of things going on here. He's talking about her. A lily among the weeds. We might say that she's the rose amongst the thorns. So we begin, we compliment her, we compliment her beauty uh, and, and the beauty among the average. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we talk about how beautiful she is. Now she, in her thing, talks about him in the apple tree. And, and, and the apple tree is the symbol of, 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 of life and, and food and, and shelter and shade. And, and she sees that, that Psalm is the, is the kind of the giver of life. I want to translate this into... Uh, to, to, uh, I'm going to see if I can get teenage slang here for a second. I'm going to translate this into dating or having a new BFF, a new best friend. You know, if you, if you have a friend and they meet somebody new, it's like their new best friend. It's like all they can do is talk about their new best friend or new boyfriend and new girlfriend. The most obnoxious person in the world is a guy with a new girlfriend. I mean, or vice versa. It's just crazy because that's all they want to talk about. You know, my new best friend is this. My new best friend does that. My new best friend is great at this. My new best friend likes this. They just on and on and on ad nauseum about this friend. An hour goes by and you say, hey, can we talk about something else other than your new girlfriend or your new boyfriend or your new best friend? I'm tired of this topic already. Like, what do you mean you're tired of this topic already? I've only told you this much about. I got this much more to go. And they just keep going on and they keep going on and talking about how beautiful or how sweet or how handsome or how nice or how well they can sing. My wife would never say that about me, but how well they do other things. And they just keep going on and on and on. Finally, you just go, time out. I gotta go. I'm done because I just can't handle any more of, of, of your, uh, your best friend. Let's translate this again into our relationship with God. Who's our eternal best friend? Who's the friend that sticks closer than their brother? Who's our eternal best friend? Who's our forever BFF? How often do we talk about our friend? How do often do we talk about God as our BFF to our other friends? That we talk about him so much that people say, time out, would you shut up and talk about something else? Do we, do we do that? Do we talk about our eternal best friend to our other friends? You know, when I say our best friend or eternal best friend, I'm talking about, you know, the one who actually died for our sins? That best friend guy, <laughs> I'm not talking about just any best friend, but, but the guy who went to Calvary for us. You know, I was reading through, I'm using Charles Stanley's Bible commentary as I, as I read through the Bible this year, and he said something that I think really strikes home as we think about this. The best evangelism that we can have, our best moments of evangelism, is when our natural love for God flows out of us. And we're just talking to our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and we're just talking about our eternal best friend and all the glorious attributes of God. That's our best witness. That's our best witness. So the question is, do our friends even know who our eternal best friend is? Do they even know who our best friend is, our eternal best friend is? Because he's part of our every bit of our conversation. Now, this, this question challenged me almost 20 years ago. I'm going to tell you a little story about a friend named Terry. Terry Dodd and I went to high school together, so I've known him since sophomore year in high school. 
I won't tell you how many years that is, but most of you are younger than that number. Um, but Terry and I also went to high school together, but then I joined the Marine Corps. And uh, about two or three weeks later, Terry grabbed hold of me and says, guess what I went did today? And he goes, what did you do? I said, I went to join the Marine Corps. We're going to go in on the buddy program. I'm like, so you're as dumb as I am. So a week after graduation from high school, Terry and I are in San Diego, bald and scared out of our minds. But somehow we managed to survive. Um, I, I went, went on to the Army. He went on to the Navy. I don't know what happened to us, but we both affected from the Marine Corps. He retired from the Navy, and he, uh, he retired and he now lives in Jacksonville, Florida. I think we know some people from there now. He, uh, he retired in Jacksonville, Florida from the Navy. And, and about 20 years ago or so, I can't remember exactly what the time frame was, I just felt under this, this, this conviction, I think I talked to him or reached, reached out to him somehow, some way, and I thought, you know, Terry's been a good friend for 20 years. I think I, I, think I was 40 at the time. So, you know, we're going all the way back to sophomores in high school, so we're 20 years out of high school. And so like, I've never talked to Terry, what I would consider probably my longest friend. Now, he lives in Jacksonville, so we don't get to see each other very often. I, I've seen, I saw him a year or so ago. And we do get together every once in a while. And uh, anytime I'm in Florida, he's, we get together. And anytime he's in Missouri, we get together. And, and we'd see each other, but I talked, I called, so I called him up, long distance. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. He's in Jacksonville, Florida. And I called him up and said, I said, Terry, I have a, I have a confession to make. Said, what? He says, you're probably one of my best friends, lifelong best friends. And I've never told you about my eternal best friend. And I proceeded to witness to him. I've been a Christian the whole time I've known Terry. I've been a Christian since I was seven years old. I had never in 20 years talked to Terry like this before. I know we had had conversations about God and we had conversations, but but I mean, I, I really witnessed to him. And he said, you know, it's interesting. Sheila and I, his wife, his wife's name Sheila, had started going to this little Baptist church. And the pastor and his wife were in the, in the driveway. And we started going to church. And I've been thinking a lot about everything you've been talking about. And I got to leave it the Lord. Long distance. St. Louis to Jacksonville. After we got done talking and praying and he, he, he prayed and accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. I said, now I want you to go back out and tell your pastor what just happened. 20 years later, he's, an, he's a leader in this church. He's a leader in this church. The question is, do we talk about God with the endearment that we would talk about our, our spouse, our wife, our husband, our BFF, the way... We talk about God the way we would talk about them. And that people are just like overwhelmed with us by the presence of God because we just keep talking about how great and glorious and beautiful and awesome he is. And they come to Christ because they want what we have. They want to meet our best friend because he's an awesome guy. And they just can't help them, but want to meet him. I want you to look to the end out of the end of the verse. That was all free. Now I'm getting into the meat of the sermon. Let's look at the end of this verse. His banner over us is love. Let's ponder that thought for a second. Let's ponder that thought. A banner. It's a flag of a country. It's a flag of the army. It's the flag of a king. It's the ensign or bearing the motto or a slogan, the standard of a sovereign Lord. When you are under the banner, when you're under the flag, you're under the protection of the nation. Now think about this as a U.S. Embassy kind of a thing. Okay, you're in a foreign land and you're in trouble. <laughs> but you see an American embassy, you see an American flag, and you say, if I can get from this side of town to that side of town, and I can get under the American flag, inside the, inside the fence of the embassy, then I'm protected by the U.S. government. I'm protected by the banner 
of the US government, the American flag. Banner over us is God's love. Think about that. We are protected by God's love. God's love is, is, our, is our fortress. God's banner, his flag, God's ensign, his slogan. Let's think about this. Let's think about what this means, though. God's banner is I am love. God's banner is I am love. And it's, again, what we hear in the story, I am love. As Christians, we stand under his banner of love. In fact, if, we, if, you could, if, I could, if, if someone said, Doug, can you summarize the, the, the Bible in one sentence? It's real simple. God is love. If, I, if you gave me one sentence, what's, what's the message of the Bible? God is love. And his greatest gift to man, think about this here, that what, his greatest gift to man was himself. He, he, he came to earth as the God-man, as the Messiah, and he died for our sins. Yet, we oftentimes feel outside of God's love. Have you ever felt unloved by people, friends, family, people you thought would have your back? Or, or have you ever felt unworthy of God's love? Why? Why do we feel unworthy of love? Again, I'm going to borrow some, some things from, from Charles Stanley's commentary. Why is it difficult for us to feel God's love? The number one reason is I think we feel unworthy. We, we feel unworthy. Sometimes we, we look at our life and we look at the sinful, depraved hearts that we have and we feel unworthy of God's love because of the evilness of our life, the sin of our life. And if you think of it from that perspective, it's true. We are unworthy because we're all sinners. But God's love is not dependent on our worthiness. God's love is not dependent on our deservedness. Romans 5, 8 says that God showed his love for us in that, what? While we we're still sinners. Christ died for us. While we were undeserving, Christ died for us. While we were unworthy, Christ died for us. If you think about that, while we were being mean and nasty, God died for us. So a lot of people struggle with that. Why would God love me? Why would God die for me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the evil that I've done. Another story, go back to Comfort's Cove, Texas. And, uh, you know, his dad was a church planter. And uh, we met at a church about this size. And uh, I was accused of marrying the only single girl in the church. And it's true, I did. Not because she was the only single girl in the church, she just happened to be the right girl. God brought me to that little church to meet a beautiful girl, and it's been a great time. But but we used to go on visitation. Her dad, I actually spent a lot of time with her dad. I think I, the, while we were dating, I spent more time with her dad than I did with her, but um, that's a whole other problem that I have. But we would go on church visitation, her dad and I, we'd go visit people in the church, and there was this lady who was coming to our church, and we'd go visit her husband, and her husband was a was a Vietnam vet. He'd served in Vietnam, a couple tours in Vietnam. And he was one of these um, long range combat patrol kind of guys. He's one of the guys that they dropped out there in the middle of nowhere and said, fight your way back and make as much destruction as you can on your way home. And uh, he did some things in Vietnam. He never shared with us exactly what he did. He said, God can't love me. We, we would witness to him, we would try to share with him God's love. And he said, God can't love me. You have no idea what I did over there. It's so bad I don't even want to talk about it. And we could never convince him that God loved him. I did some really, really bad things. 
We can never get him to the point of unconditional love. We can never get him to the point where God's love is unconditional. Uh, so best of my knowledge, he never came to Christ because he never felt God could love him. But God's love is unconditional. We struggle to fully understand unconditional love because human love is conditional. See, we our human love is conditional. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. That's human conditional love. And that, that human thinking causes doubt about God's love. Because we think, if somebody did to me what I did to God, if someone talked to me the way I talk about God, if someone treated me the way I treat God, there is no way I could ever forgive them. So we bring God's love down to human understanding. We have a struggle, we struggle with God's unconditional love because we don't understand unconditional love because our love is, is conditional. Human love is conditional. If you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. It's reciprocal. If I'm a good person, so we think that when we when we think about that in our human relationships, then it translates into our relationship with God. Well, if I'm a good person, then God will love me. But if I'm a bad person, God will hate me. But God loved us again while we were still sinners. God loved us while we were unworthy. God loved us when we were being undeserving. God loved us when we were spitting on the cross. Think about that. God loved the men who nailed him to the cross. He loved them. Look at, uh, look at what Paul had to say about love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the best line ever, love never ends. God's love never ends. Not only is it unconditional, it's never ending. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. So the gift of prophecy is going to, going to pass away. For as tongues, they will cease. The gift of tongues will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But love never ends. God's love is not emotional like ours. God's love is not reciprocal like ours. God's love is not conditional like ours because God is love. The essence of his nature. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. And if we, again, we study the Bible, we understand God, God never changes. God never changes. And God can do nothing against his character. You know, they always, they always ask the question, is there anything God can't do? Yes, God cannot betray himself. He cannot betray his own character. And God is love. God's love is not conditional. It's not based on emotional. It's not based on reciprocal love. God is love. Or another way to put this is, God's love just is. God's love just is. That's all there is to it. God's love just is. Because God is love. 
Now we go back to Solomon chapter 2, verse 4. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. The banner that we stand under as Christians is that God's banner is I am love. God says I am love. God is love. We are loved by God. It's unconditional. It's undeserved. It's never ending because the nature of God is love. If you think about it, again, back to the cross. God's greatest act of love is the cross. But God's greatest act of love is Calvary. Look at John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. This is how much God loves us. While we are dead in our trespasses and sin, while, while we're still sinners, while we're unworthy, while we're being mean and nasty, God says, you know what? The wages of sin is death. And really, Doug, you should be hung on that cross. Because you're a sinner. And the wages of sin is death. And Doug, you should be hung on that cross. But then Jesus comes, comes and he says, But Doug, I know you're a mean, nasty, vile sinner. And you deserve the cross. But can I take your place? That's substitutionary atonement. That's the love of God. I should be hanging on that cross. Jesus comes to, the, comes to the earth and says, I know that's what you deserve. That's what you have earned. Can I take your place? Would you let them nail me to the cross instead of them nailing you to the cross? That's love. That's unconditional. That's unworthy love. We're not worthy of that kind of love. But that's the love that God has for us. Let me take your place. Let me bear your burdens. Let me bear your sins. Let me bear your sorrows. Let me take the beatings. Let me take the floggings. Let them put the nails in my hands and in my feet. Let them put the crown of thorns on my head. Let me take your place on the cross. That is love. And as we read through the book of Solomon here and we, we see the metaphor of love and we start translating this into to how God loves man, we start to see the picture of God's unconditional love. So we're going to stop today. We're going to pray here. We're going to pick up here next week. I'm about done talking about this. But I'm done for the day. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to just open this love story. To know how much you love us. Your unconditional love. When we are unworthy and undeserving, you loved us enough to say, Can I take your place on the cross? Can I die in your place? Can I bear your sins? Can I bear your burdens? Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you so very much for your gift of salvation, your gift of grace, your gift of mercy. In your name we pray.